don't ask is why you make that wish in the first place. I first visited the Dream Factory when I was seven. I closed my eyes tightly shut. And I wish that I would become a professional hockey player in the NHL. <laughs> what? That, that surprised you, didn't it? Especially if you've seen me on QVC talking about style and fashion. But no, I love to skate. And I love to play. And let me tell you, I was super aggressive. So much so that my teammates called me the hitman. Some of my opponents would deliberately fall on the ice so they wouldn't have to face me. <laughs> but that surprised you too. And my parents, they encouraged me every step of the way. Then you're gonna make it one day. They bought right into that dream. Or did they actually help create it? So here's the thing. Society likes us to frame life as a funnel. We're born into this beautiful world. It is full of endless possibilities. And those possibilities, they narrow and they narrow. And then we're branded as a clever one, as a creative one, as the sporty one, as a lawyer and as a dancer. And we have to be so, so careful because oftentimes those dreams, well, they're not entirely our own. Let's say you're at the top of your class in math. Your, your parents, your teachers, your peers, they may envision a certain role for you. But I always find it so interesting how quickly their respect can turn into expect. It's like our dreams, they're morphing silently into these grand expectations. But I was the sporty one. And let me tell you, I hated losing. I don't know, maybe I was frustrated. I know I was definitely confused. I actually remember there was a classmate of mine who bullied me every single day in eighth grade. And then in ninth grade, he says, oh, I'm going to join the hockey team. So one afternoon during scrimmage practice, I lined him up across that rink and I knocked the wind right out of him. <laughs> Karma. <laughs> but I was playing at a level where I was being scouted by Boston University a division one hockey school. That was meaning I was gonna be one step away from that ultimate summit. Was I excited? Oh yeah. Was I committed? Absolutely. Was I doubting my dream? No, no, not back then. The horse blinders were on tight. But as I look back, I often wonder, whose dream was I living out? You're gonna make it, Den. Yeah, those were encouraging words, but it was also definitive. But I pushed all that aside and I set out and I'm going to make our dream come true. And then, whew, that dream factory rolled out one hell of a nightmare. A cracked femur on my growth plate left me on the ice screaming in pain. I had to have multiple screws to put my leg back together. So you know what? That was a goodbye dream. Goodbye, you're going to make it, Den. It took me six months to relearn how to walk. And wait, I just want to let you all know, for the record, I did end up at Boston University. <laughs> that summer, in theater camp. <laughs> and I dove into everything related to the performing arts, and I said, you know what, I'm going to go for the creme de la creme. I'm going to go for Carnegie Mellon University, which is basically like the Division I equivalent of theater school. And all of my friends, and all of my family, they bought right into that dream too. And they said, oh my gosh, Dan, oh my god, you're going to so make it. They assured me, and I got in. And these long days followed, and mountainous expectations ensued. And there, we were encouraged to dream, but this time we had to go a little bit higher. We had to go from Broadway lead role to Broadway lead role, to Tony Awards, to television shows, to becoming that household name. And I attacked that new dream with laser-like focus. And I defined for myself victory, which was the next rung on that ladder, the next notch on my resume. But all the while I'm climbing and I'm climbing, I never once stopped to ask myself how I felt. I never once stopped to say, let me ask myself a question. Am I in pain physically? Am, 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 I, am, I, am I doubting where I'm going? No, I just kept pushing forward to get that dream. And all the while I was notching on my resume, my first big break was causing me a lot of problems. I was in pain every time I was on stage. 
My knee was swelling after every performance. It had me doubting whether I could ever continue performing at all, but I dreamed on, I'm gonna make it. And then it happened. I booked Bernardo in West Side Story in New York, meaning I was gonna be reviewed by the New York Times. And let me tell you, I went into those rehearsals. Full out, baby. I was dancing, I was singing, I was acting, I was jumping off of fences. And, 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 and then I remember at the end of the first week of rehearsals, I looked down and lifted up the right leg to my dance pant, and my knee was the size of a watermelon. And instead of stopping, taking care of myself, oh no, I dragged and limped my way all the way to that doctor's office and I begged him, I said, please, just give me enough prednisone to get me through this show. And he did. And I got great reviews. <laughs> but the writing was on the wall. I had to quit. It was never gonna be that household name. A total nightmare. Or was it? Because with the dream factory running just a little bit dry, I just randomly on the whim was like, let me put my resume in to teach at a performing arts charter high school. And before I could literally blink my eyes, I found myself on a one-way flight to Palmetto, Florida to teach at the Manatee School for Performing Arts. And I had 2,000 students. And I felt reinvigorated. I felt free. I felt like I had a new purpose. And no, it wasn't because I had a new job, but it was like when 2020 vision, you go to the doctor's office and then that prescription becomes clear. It was what I finally valued in life, which was that look on a student's eye when they say, I got a new idea. Or when they pull you aside after class and they say, Mr. Kenny, oh my goodness, because of you, I finally found my confidence. And all the while, this completely magical time in my life was happening, I couldn't quite just kick this little feeling in the back of my mind like I had unfinished business in New York. So at a long weekend off, I just went to visit the big city and a very good friend of mine invited me to a Lacoste fashion show. And there in the front row and under the lights and the fashion and the extravaganza, it all changed. I guess you could say it was another impromptu trip to the Dream Factory. You see, as a side note, I also always loved fashion. I just always knew what it took to really put together a fabulous outfit. <laughs> so I, I left the show, I was all excited, I found the nearest park bench, I sat down, I handed him my cell phone, I said, take a picture of my outfit of the day, and then I took it and put it out on social media. Rinse and repeat every day after that. <laughs> Six months later, I was the head fashion stylist at Good Morning America, which subsequently led me to becoming the creative director of one of the largest retailers in the nation, and now I'm a lecturer at Harvard Business School. And that was the first time in my life where I didn't need to hear that I was going to make it or keep on pushing for your dream. And it wasn't because I was starting to experience the cash and prizes that you hear about coming with success, but it was because I finally found what made me happy. So what's the moral of this story? First of all, don't break your leg. <laughs> and you don't need to have multiple skills and multiple careers, but it's simply to keep an open mind. You know, as we're kids, we're often asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And we're supposed to look up and then we answer with this single dream, a single career, a single choice that we can study towards so we can eventually become something. And that's something it typically requires a lot of investment. And I'm not just talking financially, although it's pricey, but also of time of emotion and hard graft. But I'm the lucky one. And no, not because I've been able to have all of these fabulous careers, but because my parents have always supported me. I remember when I called my dad on a payphone from college to tell him I'm coming out of the closet. Woo, woo. Hi, dad? Uh, yeah, I'm gay. And he paused, and then he responded in his thick Boston accent. Yeah, then, your mother and I kind of had a feeling. <laughs> when are you coming home? 
I dread to think how I would have managed to pivot in my career the way I have had it not been for that level of support. But this is about more than the people around you. It's about you. It's about being honest. And I look back and I don't think I was honest enough with myself because although I was saying I wanted to be this big, rough and tough hockey player, the truth of the matter was I got more of a kick being on this stage. And although I always loved fashion, I just kept pushing in the other direction. And uh, well, I definitely had an inkling that I was gay before I ever had a girlfriend. Sorry, Jen. <laughs> but the dream factory, it doesn't only stay open when you're a kid. And it's not gonna shut when you all pick up your diplomas and head out there in the real world. And it's not gonna shut when you get the big promotion at work. In fact, the dream factory works best when we revisit on a regular basis. When we align our hopes and our dreams and our paths to happiness. When we give something our all, but we also manage to pause and to say, is this still right? Because life is too short to just keep pushing on to save face. You know, some of the happiest people that I have met are the ones that have jumped right off that conveyor belt. You've all heard the stories, like the banker, he gives it all up to write his memoir, or, or the lawyer who says, you know what, I'm gonna become a geography teacher, or that design student who becomes a rock climbing instructor and then opens up a successful catering business. And I just, I don't know, I just feel like there's something in that for us all. It's like, reach for the stars with everything you have, but also to manage to pivot to pirouette, and to plan as we go. And to have the self-confidence to say, you know what, I'm gonna pick up and I'm gonna aim for a different star. And to step backwards to make it all possible. I guess it's to revisit the dream factory and not to wait for a broken leg or a swollen knee to force a change that should have happened a long, long time ago. And uh, for most of us, Look, our parents, they don't care if you become this big hockey player, a big actor, a, a teacher, or a cook. They just want us to be happy. Which is why I want to say, look, Mom and Dad, I made it. <laughs> your son is happy and he's doing what he loves. I hope all of your sons and daughters will too. Thank you. <laughs>